Hello and welcome once again to another episode of our interesting stories in the history of diagnostics. This is Mickey Yerday for Alteris Associates and I look forward to talking about lateral flow assays, sort of the history of them and where the field is going. Lateral flow assays go all the way back to 1943 with work on paper chromatography that was conducted by two characters. So one is Archer John Porter Martin and Richard Lawrence Millington Singe. Great names. And they shared the Nobel Prize in 1952 for their work. And after World War II, just in 1945, a great deal of work started going on in this paper chromatography, which ended up being developed into these lateral flow type assays. And it's just been an explosion ever since. I mean, I'll tell you today, this technology is used more often than probably any other technology in diagnostics at this time. I'm going to explain the basic principles of lateral flow assays. Now, I know a number of you out there are going to be bored to death by this. I apologize. Let me just talk about it briefly so I can set the stage for those who have not been familiar with this technology. The sort of classic approach to this is to use a strip of nitrocellulose. And that nitrocellulose has on it a few things. One, it has a line that's going to be used for the test and another line for control. And then it has somewhere on it dried down reagents. Now, The typical assay format in a lateral flow assay is a so-called sandwich assay, which means that there are two antibodies required. The first one is a so-called capture antibody that sits on the nitrocellulose. In fact, it's adhered to it, not movable. And then a second antibody, which is labeled. And the classic label has been colloidal gold. And interestingly, it shows up as red, which is kind of odd for gold, but that's because of a phenomenon called plasmon resonance, which occurs at its surface. So the antibodies that are labeled are set on a little portion of that nitrocellulose between where the sample is going to be added and then where the first line for the test is going to be performed and a second line for the control. So the antibody that's, that's sitting on the test line is the one that's going to bind to the uh, target of interest, usually a protein. And let's just use SARS-CoV-2 as an example with its antigen, which is, of course is very familiar to most everyone nowadays. The second line for the control has on it a second antibody, usually to something that's present in whatever the sample is. And typically people use blood. So IgG is a good example of something that would be there. So the way that the test is conducted is that a sample is put on the bottom portion of that strip. Usually a buffer is added as well. And then the sample moves up as it's wicking across that nitrocellulose picks up the antibodies which have been dried down that have the gold label on them and then passes over the test line. And at that point, the capture antibody should capture the antigen of interest if it's there. And then it passes beyond that. And if the sample is added properly, the control line now has the IgG bound to it. And the antibodies that are required to bind to the antigen bind and then to the IgG bind, and we see a few different possibilities. One is that the control line lights up, but not the test line. Why is that? It's because the sample was there, it was processed properly, but in fact, there was no detectable amount of the antigen of interest or antibody of interest in some forms of tests, but we're talking about SARS-CoV-2 right now. The second possibility is the control line and the test line show up, which means that it is a positive test. And if you get neither line light up, that means that the test was not run properly. Either the person didn't add the sample to it or the buffer wasn't added or something else is wrong. So that would be an invalid test. Okay, there's a simple background. There are many products available in these lateral flow assay formats. There are tests for HIV, malaria, hepatitis viruses, C-reactive protein. The list goes on and on and on, and it's getting longer and longer. But the fact that so many tests now are available for SARS-CoV-2 and the capabilities that were developed by many companies as a result of that, they're ability to manufacture large quantities of them, do it very, very well. That has opened a door for the application of lateral flow assays to many other things. So one of the things that surprises many people is that lateral flow assays now are capable of performing tests at a lab quality level. Let me give this an example, HIV. HIV antibody detection in both a so-called professional format where a nurse or someone is going to use the test or self-testing. So even for self-testing today, it's possible to get assay sensitivity from 97 to 99% which is quite remarkable, and with specificity of 99% to 100%. So this is in untrained users' hands. 
first time they open the package, use it for themselves by following a simple set of instructions, they are able to get that level of performance, which is kind of surprising. But that's where we are. The technology works extraordinarily well if developed properly. But nevertheless, there, there is a great need for additional innovation in this area. And many groups are focused on that. One group that has been funded by the Gates Foundation for several years now is CARD. And that is in the UK, north of London. And it's run by an individual named Paul Davis, Professor Paul Davis, who has a long history in lateral flow assays going all the way back to the days he was at Unilever, where they developed so-called clear blue pregnancy tests. So this was launched in 1985 in, in the UK. So, you know, it's been around for some time and he's continued to innovate for all these years and still is. Another place is the DCN, which is in San Diego, California. Both these organizations will help others design and develop assays for their own portfolio. Then, of course, there are a lot of companies that are out there that develop their own tests and have done that very, very well. Coidel in San Diego also, Abbott, the old Allure company, which they purchased many years ago. You know, those are organizations that still pursue letter flow assays, as do many other companies. The areas of innovation are two. One is in trying to improve the performance of the tests. And the second is in trying to improve the usability of the test. In order to improve the performance, typically people want to improve the sensitivity or the lower limit of detection of the test. And they are trying to do that by firstly increasing the signal of the test. The cold order gold is only visible at a fairly high concentration. So people have moved to things like fluorescent dyes, but you can't see fluorescent dyes directly. So you need to use a reader along with that as opposed to the colorimetric version of the test where you simply look at it and know whether it's reactive or not. So this has led to so-called fluorescent amino assay versions of lateral flow and companies like CTK Biotech, also in San Diego. Don't know why that's a hotbed for lateral flow, but it is. They have developed a series of assays with fluorescent tags that permit them to look at things such as high sensitivity troponin and other cardiac markers. But often the signal is not the problem. It is the signal to noise. That is the non-specific binding of of something in the assay is causing enough background that you can't see the signal over the background. So to improve that, you typically have to improve the reagents themselves. So there have been a number of groups that have been trying to improve antibodies for many years. There are some very innovative new approaches to that now, one of which is at the Alamar Biosciences here in the Bay Area, and they have what they call adobodies, which are remarkable new versions of antibodies. And then there are people that are trying to use replacements of antibodies, such as aptamers. And the company Somalogic was the pioneer here. Newer companies such as Velocity Sciences, they are pursuing these modified nucleic acids that can bind like an antibody and exploit those capabilities. And then another area, which has been under investigation for some years, is called molecular imprint polymers. And there's a company called MIP Diagnostics, which is pursuing that. So there are a lot of innovations going on on that side. The other side of the innovation has to do with usability. By this, I mean the ability of an individual to take the package, look at the instructions for use and perform it properly. Now, the self-tests are done fairly well, but there's room for improvement there. And if you really want to be able to do everything you can do in a laboratory test, in a lateral flow test, you probably need to improve your usability as well. So there are two approaches to improving usability. One is the actual design of the device that you perform the lateral flow assay in. Typically, it's a fairly simple either strip that is used directly or it's in some sort of a plastic cassette container. But there are really interesting approaches to this, for instance, by the company Otomo in Australia. Otomo has devised new cartridge forms that have been used in HIV testing, as a matter of fact. And they have, for instance, a built-in lancet to be able to collect blood. Or they have a buffer that's built into the device, and you push a button in order to release the buffer. These are ways in which to decrease the kind of errors that are typically run into in the field and doing usability studies. So it's a very interesting approach to trying to improve the performance in non-trained users' hands. The second approach is actually to give them online assistance. An example there would be the company Exa Health. And Exa is in pursuit of an EUA for a method of using your telephone and an app to run you through the process of how to perform the test properly. It will stop and wait for you. It will actually help give you information about how to do it properly if you're having trouble with it. Very interesting to think about those two things together and how usability of these tests could be 
improved such that they really are possible for almost any human being to run first time they try. So given all the effort in the ability to manufacture letter flow assays, really spearheaded by the effort in SARS-CoV-2, also the fact that these improvements in performance, improvements in usability are, are coming about, we're definitely going to see a lot more types of letter flow assays in the marketplace for use at home, for use in clinics, for uses in place we probably haven't even thought about using them yet. So thank you once again for tuning in to Interesting Stories in the History of Diagnostics. This is Mickey Yurday for Alteris Associates. Thanks very much, and I'll see you next time.